Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on behavioral insights into uh, public policy. Uh, let me, at the outset, wish you all a very good morning and to warmly welcome you to this session. Uh, please allow me to also thank uh, Inche Abbey, our Master of Ceremonies, uh, for having uh, brought us in into this uh, session. I also take this opportunity to thank the Malaysia Productivity Corporation for the invitation extended to me uh, to moderate this, this first session of our uh, conference on behavioral insights. This particular section, session uh, fo uh, focuses on public policy making, how behavioral insights can help in policy making as well as in the implementation of a public policy. Uh, behavioral insights is a, is a very recent discipline. It is multidisciplinary, in fact, including economics, sociology, psychiatry, but essentially it is all about the study of human behavior. How and why do humans react the way they do for a particular public policy? For example, if we take the goods and services tax that Malaysia introduced uh, previously, there was a big, huge hue and cry in the, in the, among the public. Now, if behavioral insights will study why is it that they behave that way and how the, the findings of this study can be used in designing a similar policy and implementing a similar policy elsewhere. But we, I should leave this to our experts. Uh, today, uh, the Malaysia Productivity, Co uh, Malaysia Productivity Corporation has lined up two distinguished speakers to uh, let us know how and why is behavioral insights crucial to public policy making. Our first speaker is Mr. Uh, Alex Clark. Mr. Clark is a senior advisor of the Behavioral Insights team in Singapore. And, and the Behavioral Insights team in Singapore were the first government team dedicated to applying behavioral science to solve policy problems. Mr. Clark joined uh, Singapore, the Singapore office in 2016 and has led a number of key projects in partnership with the Ministry of Health and Financial Planning Program Office of the Government of Singapore. In the last 12 months, he has been working in Bangladesh on reducing COVID-19 transmission. In China and Indonesia, he has been working on wildlife conservation and in Malaysia on financial behavior research. An equally illustrious uh, gentleman who is in our panel today is Dr. Nias Asdabullah, who is a professor of development economics at the Faculty of Economics and Administration, University Malaya. He has held a number of research and fellowship posts across the world, spanning from Oxford, Reading, Harvard, in the e in the West, in the in the West to Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia in the East. He is a prolific writer, a prolific researcher, and a, and a public speaker, very much sought after. He is also uh, an editor of a number of reputed journals, such as the Malaysian Economic Journal and the International Journal of, De of Educational Development. His research interests include development economics, labor economics and economics of education. I'm so sorry, I do not, uh, I'm not doing justice to our two speakers by giving such a short synopsis of their illustrious career, but I thought it is better to hear them uh, straight uh, than to swamp you with uh, their, their, their very long uh, curriculum vitae. So without much ado, uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Clark, who will be our first speaker. He will have some 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will call uh, Professor Nias, 
who will have another 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions and answers from our panel. If, if that is okay, uh, please allow me to invite on behalf of our audience today, uh, Mr. Alex Clark to say his piece on uh, what and how behavioral insights help public policy making and implementation. Mr. Clark, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Xavier. I'm actually going to ask um, Professor Niaz to start. Um, we've done a little conferring amongst ourselves and established that it might be good for him to do the introductionary uh, part. It. So, uh, Professor Niaz, can I, can I pass to you? Thank you very much. Uh, not to yes. worry. Yes, sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to start. I'm going to upload my slides. Um, so again, you know, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Xavier for his very generous uh, introduction. Um, so um, as you know, my co-panelist pointed out, Alex, that this first lecture is supposed to be kind of an introduction into his lecture. Uh, so it will provide a quick overview of the behavioral foundation of public policy. I will introduce you to BIs and clarify what it means for 21st century policymaking. Um, here is the outline. I'll start with some of the key policy challenges for Malaysia. Then I'll explain why tackling these challenges effectively requires a sound understanding of human behavior. I will do so by unpacking the policy cycle and tracing the roots of some of the common causes of policy failure to our limited cognitive and psychological capacity. Then I will explain how the policy cycle can be informed and improved by leveraging behavioral insights. So let me start. Today, Malaysia is at a critical juncture. Thanks to a range of policy interventions in the past, we are on course to becoming a high income nation. And yet there is growing unhappiness and frustration among ordinary citizens this hints at, at a mismatch, a mismatch between achievements and public expectations, which imply unmet targets. Now, this is something that the government realizes. Both the Malaysia Plan and Vision Prosperity 2030 have already identified new goals. But achieving these new targets require smart choices at a time of budget cuts. Our government also recognizes, therefore, the need for a people-centric policymaking culture. And when we look at policy documents, particularly the 11 Malaysia plan, there is a clear shift in language. Uh, compared to 10 and 9 Malaysia plan, the word well-being uh, is now dominating in the policy document. It therefore recognizes the that the ultimate objective of policy is to ensure that ordinary citizens are being well. But you might ask, what does well-being mean? And what are the sort of well-being challenges for Malaysia? Well, they range from concerns over obesity among adults to stunting among our children, concerns over food insecurity in the coming days because of aging farmers concern over high debt burden among households, as well as our university graduates. And of course, I may all add financial insecurity in old age. All of these well-being challenges have one thing in common. They are rooted in behavioral choice and addressing these challenges require behavioral change. And what would these changes involve? Well, you know, they you know, involve a range of behavior. Uh, you know, promoting healthy eating and, uh, you know, overcoming unbalanced diet, cutting down on excess uh, sugar consumption. A typical Malaysian in a year consumes three kilograms of sugar, for instance. Uh, for food insecurity, it would require encouraging youth participation in the farming sector. Uh, also promoting automation, not just in agriculture, but also in our SMEs. And for old age financial security, it requires encouraging adequate savings in EPF today. And also for our youth struggling with PTPT and debts, it demands financial discipline. 
But these are not quite new challenges for policymakers. In the past, a range of policy tools have been employed to influence citizen behavior. They include monetary incentives such as tax cuts, subsidies, and often they include coercive and other regulatory steps, including legal bans. Now, this is what economists call carrot and stick measures. Um, you know, but beyond these carrot and stick measures, government departments also routinely run information campaigns, campaigns to promote pro-social behavior among citizens. So the big question is this, that why despite such proactive policy interventions, progress has been lacking in some respect. So, you know, in, you know, sometimes it is down to policy failure that there isn't a shortage of, you know, good policies in Malaysia, but we, we you know, often lack in terms of putting that in practice, what we call implementation failure. But policy failure occurs in multiple stages of the policy cycle. It's not just you know, a matter of not getting it implemented. Sometimes the failure occurs at the evaluation stage uh, so that wrong policy continues based on incorrect and faulty evaluation, which gives it uh, a clean sheet. But sometimes the problem is much up in the policy cycle, in the design phase. Um, Sometimes it is just a poorly conceived policy that was not, you know, meant to work. So, what, however, uh, we have to realize is that at any stage of the policy cycle, there can be policy failure, and it is for multiple reasons. But often there is a shared cause of policy failure. Now, sometimes the behavioral explanation for policy failure includes strategic and rational counter response to a policy intervention, which cancels out the intended policy effect. Take, for example, uh, the case of passing of a law in Mexico that raised the minimum marriage age to 18 years. Now, while on one hand, this reduced underage marriage and teenage pregnancy among married youths, on the other hand, uh, it saw a rise in births among underaged unmarried mothers in informal unions. So therefore, canceling out the overall impact on fertility among young mothers. Another example of this uh, unintended rational strategic behavioral response that can upset a policy intervention is in the context of tobacco consumption. Many countries uh, introduce high tax to carb consumption of tobacco, um, but what often happens, which is also true for Malaysia, is that this encourages a growth of illicit trade of imported cheap cigarettes. And uh, the end result is that the overall presence of tobacco consumption remains unchanged, and that comes often at the cost of a net reduction in tax revenue. But policies also fail for behavioral resistance to intended change. Policy failure is not just about rational response. Sometimes it is about lack of rational response or what we call behavioral resistance. And that is the main focus of my lecture today. So what do we mean by behavioral resistance? Um, uh, you know, as I was saying that, well, social science is evidence now uh, confirms that citizen behavior often deviate from self-seeking rational, uh, you know, uh, choices. Uh, this happens in a variety of contexts. And the reason for this is that our choices are not only governed by concerns of our financial costs and benefits, but we also respond to social norms and social pressure. Sometimes our inability to respond to a policy intervention is down to limits of rational decision-making abilities. Most of us have bounded attention. Many of us lack self-control and willpower. Uh, we are also vulnerable to inattention and forgetfulness. This realization calls for a new set of policy instruments to stimulate behavioral change among citizens. But what does all of these mean for the role of state? Who is in charge of public policy making? Well, you know, you know, behaviorally sensitive policy making demands going beyond 
neoliberalism and developmental state, or what we can call a paternalistic state. It is a state that recognizes that citizens' capacity to choose is constrained, that they don't always be rationally, that well-being laws can be affected by scarcity of attention and poor options, particularly among income poor citizens. And all of these justify paternalistic policy or what behavioral scientists would call nudging. This raises a question, what then should guide public policy making in an era of neo-paternalism? I suppose that is the main theme of this conference. The short answer is behavioral insights. But again, what is behavioral insights? And where do we get these insights from? Now, one way to think of behavioral insight is to think in terms of a potential list of decision-making mistakes and cognitive biases we suffer from in our day-to-day -day life. BI also includes a set of principles that you know, can help us think slowly and carefully about actual human behavior. In reality, we think automatically, socially, and with mental models. Knowledge about this thinking process can become a valuable guide for designing effective and efficient public policy. But again, where do we get these insights from? Well, they come from government academia collaboration. Over the past decades, um, you know, we have continuously gathered new behavioral insights from economists, psychologists on what works and what doesn't in a behaviorally sensitive policy setting. This partnership remains con critical for successful uh, BI-driven policymaking. But what does BI actually mean for pra practitioners? Well, for policy colleagues, BI principles provide a non-regulatory approach that attempts to motivate individual behavior choice uh, through subtle changes in the choice environment that people face. These changes are often small and they cost very little. Again, behavioral scientists call these nudges. They are attractive for policymakers because small and low-cost nudges are attuned to human psychology and can have big impact, creating large improvements to policy, uh, public policy. Simply put, therefore, behavioral nudges work by tweaking the environment within which citizens make choices. But again, how, you know, what do they look like in practice? What do these nudges look like? As around the world, uh, governments already have opened mind behavior and development units, or what we call BI units. The purpose is to innovate ways to change the choice environments to promote a target behavior among citizens. This involves a variety of behaviors, such as consumption of healthy meals by school children, consuming less sugar, timely payment of tax. Uh, due to the government. Sometimes nudges also target bureaucrats uh, and their performance. So therefore, depending on the context, in practice, nudges involve very small details, such as choice of words and sentences in public communication letter or posters. Uh, sometimes they also include small adjustment to the design of physical circumstances shaping choice, be that in school, be that in a public hospital. This can also take the form of simple certificate of appreciation or organizing ceremonies to motivate public you know, employees. So let us consider two uh, short examples. Low tax revenue collection is a challenge for many governments around the world. Uh, this is true for Malaysia, but this is also true for the British government. Therefore, the BI, one BI intervention in England um, involved the HMRC uh, revising their letters sent annually to citizens for tax collection. Um, the typical letter would have a statement reminding them that the tax is overdue and um, that how it should be paid. The BI intervention included inserting a sentence which is highlighted here in a red circle the sentence says nine out of ten people pay their tax on time 
This was um, motivated by the fact that our choices not just respond to availability of information, but we're also sensitive to social norms, norms regarding what others in the country are doing regarding payment of tax. So insertion of this simple social norm message led to a big impact that more people pay taxes on time who received the letter with this sentence. A control group of citizens who received the letter without that sentence had a lower you know, uh, tax rate payment or, or less on time. Another ex example relates to a different challenge, which is performance of bureaucrats. Um, it's a, a problem in many parts of the world, if not in Malaysia, that school teachers in government schools uh, receive salary but don't show up, they're in the classroom but not teaching, and so on and so forth. So therefore, we always try to motivate bureaucrats and common policy solutions include better pay packages and sometimes also including performance bonus. But as we know in Malaysia that implementing uh, you know, bonus can be politically challenging. Uh, there is already divided public opinions in Malaysia in favor of bonuses for civil servants. And there are other concerns that introduction of bonus can crowd out intrinsic motivation. In this context, behavioral insights can help. A less expensive BI-focused intervention can exploit the fact that bureaucrats like other citizens respond to social recognition and therefore uh, yes Professor, you have uh, two more minutes okay so i'm almost there okay so therefore you know uh, what uh, the intervention did in nigeria was to introduce certificate of excellence for bureaucrats in the health sector and that led to noticeable improvement in public service performance so this takes me uh to my concluding three slides, uh, that what is the main takeaway from this lecture? What is new for public policy design and practice? Well, we have learned that avoiding policy ineffectiveness, uh, for avoiding policy ineffectiveness, we must take behavioral responses seriously. And this involves both service provider as well as beneficiary. But this requires going beyond rational and strategic responses by service providers and beneficiary. We must also take into account fully the apparent irrational choices or often behavioral resistance among service providers and beneficiaries, which I have explained are so often rooted in cognitive bias and our psychological limits. So therefore overlooking psychological factors uh, it does not help in policy, uh, policy planning, fully recognizing the full range of policy psychological factors does significantly affect design, delivery, and implementation of public policy. Ignoring them can lead to ineffective policy and in extreme form can cause policy failure. So therefore, the main takeaway is that alongside traditional public policy tools, which is fiscal incentive, information provision, and law, we must invest in the design and implementation of nudges to make public policy efficient and effective. So again, uh, to achieve this, uh, we have to acknowledge that policy cycle has a behavioral foundation, which covers all stages of policy cycle, implementation, evaluation, and design. Nudges can help not just in implementation, but also in the design phase. And there are also new insights that can be used to improve evaluation. So to conclude, therefore, um, Malaysia is at a crossroads today. Citizens are demanding more from the state at a time of budget cuts. Managing this mismatch between resources and public expectations require reinventing the policy cycle, going beyond traditional causes of policy failure. It is in this context that this conference is emphasizing on behavioral science how practitioners can design a new generation of public services that are not just effective, but also save taxpayers money. I've explained why and how BI has implication, not just for how citizens respond, but how bureaucrats perform. For practitioners, therefore, BI offers a reflexive, frugal, and non-regulatory approach to policy making. For policy entrepreneurs among you, those who wish to innovate and diffuse policy 
ideas, new policy ideas. VI is really the new design science. So I'll stop here. This was just meant to be an introductory lecture on the need for a behaviorally informed and responsive policy cycle. I have not said much on the science underlying how to select, design, and implement a nudge. That I leave to my co-panelist, Alex, who is going to speak next. And then he really have a lot of exciting stuff to share. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nias, for a very insightful exposition on the behavioral insights into public policy making. Uh, Professor Nias highlighted that there is a mismatch between public expectations and public policy. And therefore, behavioral insights can be leveraged upon for better policy making, better policy design, as well as policy implementation. And he talked about how uh, the behavior can be modified through regulation, uh, through nudges, uh, through information campaigns, through monetary incentives. And that way, we can uh, align uh, human behavior in the direction that the public policy intends it to be. Uh, Professor Nias also took us in, through the public policy cycle, uh, policy making, implementation, evaluation, and back to uh, refinement. And he feels that much of public policy failure today is because we lack a systematic evaluation of public policy implementation. And even if we do have evaluation, we do not incorporate the findings from the evaluation to making uh, adjustments uh, to the public policy for a uh, better implementation in the future. And of course, uh, Professor Nias also talks about the unintended behavioral uh, aspects of policy implementation. We want them, uh, we want the public to do something, but in the process, there is an unintended consequence that drags uh, policy implementation and doesn't allow it to move forward. Uh, for example, he talked about increasing the tax for tobacco, but you increase the tax for tobacco to, to, to prevent uh, people con uh, smoking, but in the end, we, the unintended consequence is illicit uh, tobacco traffic. And of course, he, he brought in a very, uh, a very pertinent uh, aspect in behavioral insights, and that's about nudging how uh, bureaucrats can nudge the people or the target group into aligning their behavior in the way that the public policy intervention was intended to, uh, to, to make them go in that direction. And of course, uh, this will be the subject matter of uh, Mr. Alex uh, Clark, who will talk to us now on how we can use the concept of nudging into uh, the process of a better public policy design and implementation. Over to you, Mr. Clark. Thank you so much, Dr. Xavier, for those kind words. Um, uh, and to Professor Niaz um, for helping to situate um, behavioral insights um, and the behavioral insights approach within the wider context of uh, policy making for our policy maker attendees uh, and doing so in the face of um, some uh, some technical teething troubles and nevertheless not losing his flow to which of course I'm sure we're all very grateful uh, and then finally before I start um, to uh, with my my list of gratitude uh, should extend to MPC as well for organizing uh, this fantastic event so um, let's see if I can share my screen um so if i press present here can someone uh, confirm to me that you can see uh, my slides in presentation mode yes fantastic okay let's yes, uh, let's proceed thanks both um so um as i said professor Nias has done a great job of of giving us some 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 sort of policy making context what i'd like to do is just very briefly in the next few minutes um, talk a little bit about sort of uh, what we mean by behavioral insights and, and explore that a little bit um, um, in a little bit more detail. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to carry on with um, 
uh, the process that Professor, Professor Nias has already begun, which is talking through examples, which I think are actually often uh, the best way for us to sort of um, uh, digest some of this, some of this information, and see what it means uh, for us as as policymakers. Um, but let's start by defining behavioral insights. So um, this is a definition created by the behavioral insights team a few years ago. Um, and, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard this term, and, but maybe not everyone has heard this definition. So behavioral insights are empirical findings about human behavior that can be used to make public policy more effective. Uh, and in this way, we distinguish from the behavioral sciences, which are a collection of academic disciplines as described, including economic, sociology, psychology, uh, and others. Um, to break this down slightly more, uh, behavioral insights are empirical findings, so those that have been tested and shown to be effective, often in the behavioral sciences, often by behavioral science academics. Um, they are insights about human behavior, an uh, important focus uh, that is different from attitudes or beliefs. We are most interested in what it is that people do. We're interested in decision making, how people actually behave, um, less so attitudes and beliefs, um, only insofar as those affect real behavior. Um, and finally, it's about um, insights that make public policy more effective, that are applicable, that are practicable. And this is really the key distinction. Um, so next time someone says to you behavioral science or behavioral insights, and you're trying to remember uh, the distinction between, hopefully you can uh, think back to, uh, to this definition. Behavioral insights really is an approach for applying the behavioral sciences to policy. Uh, and again, I think examples are most helpful here. Let's start with a work example of behavioral sciences, the academic discipline. So um, this was a academic experiment a few years ago, a research study, um, which was looking at a consumer research piece. And the way it works is as follows. So they brought in um, uh, people into a, uh, into, a, in, uh, into a setting with um, uh, a, you know, a, re a researcher, uh, a wardrobe, and within that wardrobe, three business suits. Um, and let's call those suits A, B, and C. Those are the three suits. And so the researcher said, okay, thank you for coming and helping us. Um, I've got these three suits here. Uh, there's a mirror here also. All I want you to do is just uh, try out these suits, uh, try them on, test them out, and then um, decide you know, what you think about them. We're interested in your opinion, and then I'm going to be in the next room. And when you're finished trying, you know, trying them out, come through to the next room, uh, and, I will, uh, and I will receive your feedback. And so, uh, you know, let's say that you're all part of this uh, part of this study. You you go into the next room, and let's say I'm the researcher. I say which is the best suit, and then you have to decide what your answer is. Seems seems pretty simple. Um, but let's say when you come into that next room, you're not the only person in there. It's not just me and you. It's me, you, and several other people, and they're in a queue, and they're queuing up to me. And each of them says, "I think B is the best suit." So I say, which is the best suit? I think B, I think B, I think B. And then I ask you. So this, of course, is an experiment. Um, in fact, um, those three persons in the queue, um, they're not real consumers. They're actually working with me, the researcher. Um, and what I've done is I've uh, randomized people, um, everyone who's, who's really in this experiment, um, into two groups. So uh, we take a group of people and some of them respond on their own. I just ask you. And some of them you respond only after other people have said, I think suit B is the best. Now, the final, um, uh, a, a very important part of how this experiment works is that those three suits that I asked you to try on and test out, well, they're actually the same suit. We've just labeled them A, B, and C, but they're actually precisely the same. And so what the experiment is trying to uncover is uh, how social influence works in practice, um, something we might call a social norm. Um, a social norm, Professor Niaz uh, mentioned this previously, but what a social norm is in practice is it's sort of uh, how my peers behave. It's sort of what is the, the standard way of doing things? What is the, 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 the normal thing that other people around me do? And, and this can be very influential specifically in situations where I maybe have limited information or I have high uncertainty. And when you're looking at three suits, which are actually exactly the same, you probably do have very high uncertainty about which suit is best because they're the same suit. Um, now, 
they asked people, and they asked some people who were asking, responding by themselves, and some people who were responding after the actors. And what they saw was that people responding by themselves, around 21% picked suit B. That, that's probably what we would expect, right? Because the three suits are the same, so we'd imagine around a third of people would pick each suit. It's a little less than that, but it's, but it's pretty similar. Um, but if you respond after other persons, almost half of people chose suit B. And so what we're seeing here is a decision under uncertainty. I'm making a decision in an uncertain environment. I don't have a clear answer. And in that situation, I can be very strongly influenced by various environmental factors, one of which is the behavior of my peers, what are other people doing. And that's a social norm in practice. Um, and as you can see here, this can be very powerful. It can really influence um, our decision making. Now, you might reasonably say, well, you know, this behavioral science academic work is all very well, but, you know, does this influence decisions that matter? So what the Behavioral Insights team did is we applied this finding around social norms, this behavioral insight, which we thought could influence public policy, uh, to a policy challenge, uh, specifically antimicrobial resistance. So that is um, uh, the, 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 the slow uh, increase of uh, drug resistance of bugs. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, we think that uh, antimicrobial resistance is on the rise is overprescription uh, an overconsumption of antibiotics. So, you know, you might have antibiotics that are going into um, the, 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 the animals which you eat, which you consume as food, uh, as well as antibiotics going into your own person. Antibiotics being prescribed when actually antibiotics uh, aren't going to work, aren't going to help, aren't going to make a difference. Um, and so what we did in the UK is we identified uh, those GPs who were sending, uh, who were prescribing, I should say, uh, more antibiotics um, than their peers. Um, and then we told them. We told them that the great majority, 80% of practices in London or Birmingham or whatever the area this GP was uh, located in, prescribe fewer antibiotics per head than yours. And that was absolutely true. That was based on the data, the prescription data that was uh, that is publicly available in the UK. Um, and so we sent this letter. And the idea of this letter is what we're trying to do is we're saying to GPs, everyone else is choosing suit B. Everyone else effectively is prescribing fewer antibiotics per head than yours. And so we're trying to see if that will influence their behavior. Our letter does a couple of other things. It provides um, a uh, it's it's written from a from a from the perspective of an expert. It provides some strategies and techniques that GPs could use to avoid prescribing uh, medication because, of course, you are uh, they are frequently in a difficult situation, particularly when patients are specifically asking, you know, give me some drugs. I want some drugs. I don't feel well. Um, and of course, and is 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 is, is standard practice with, with behavioral insights approaches. We evaluated we evaluated this using an experiment. Um, and what we did is we randomized different GPs. Uh, some of them received the letter, some of them didn't. And then we watched to see how their prescription rates changed. Now, the gray, the dark gray line here is the antibiotics prescription rates for those who did not receive the letter. And the blue line is those who did. And you can see that uh, consistently the, the doctors to whom we sent this letter were prescribing fewer antibiotics. This, this, this small thing, this single letter, uh, led to a significant decrease um, in prescription rates. So much so that uh, right towards the end of our study in April, um, we, um, we, we actually ended up sending the same letter to uh, those we hadn't sent the letter to originally, which is why the gray line meets the blue line in April. because We just sent the letter to everyone because it seemed to be working. Um, the tax example that Prof Professor Niaz mentioned earlier, it uh, uses the exact same um, mechanism, this social norms. Again, the idea is that the, the, the people involved don't realize that their behavior is uh, normatively deviant, that, that, that everyone else is doing this other thing. They just, we do have a tendency to kind of assume that everyone thinks like us, everyone makes the same sort of, um, goes through the same thought processes that we do, that our behavior is normal. And so in these situations, alerting people that, well, nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time, and you don't, or, you know, 80% of doctors are 
prescribing fewer antibiotics and you're prescribing more makes us it, 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 it it's very attention grabbing it makes us realize that there is something uh, that, that, that there is an issue with our behavior that uh, it motivates us uh, to want to adjust that behavior so um i hope i hope that's that's helpful um for those of you uh, tuning into to this session, thinking you know, I, I uh, but these behavioural insights, these nudges are all very well, but um, you know, what does it mean in practice? And I hope I've sort of uh, illustrated that a little bit. And most significantly, that these behavioural insights, though they can seem very small, they 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 can have an impact on what would seem to us extremely important decisions. Um, and that, I think, leads me to this rather nice quote from Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner for economics, um, who said that it turns out that the environmental effects on behavior are a lot stronger than most people expect. And this, for me, is, is the really important thing for when we're thinking about applying behavioral insights, learning from behavioral insights for public policymaking in Malaysia, is this recognition that there's lots of little things around our policy, particularly in the last mile, the implementation, the sharp end, as it were, that, that are having this outsized effect on, on its efficacy, on its impact. And, and studying behavioral insights, using a behavioral insights approach, um, learning from behavioral sciences can help us recognize those environmental effects and make sure they're working with the policy rather than against the policy. Um, so, let me give you a couple of examples. As I said, I think examples are often uh, the most uh, helpful way to sort of engage with 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 a new approach. Um, and so, I'm just going to walk through um, some thoughts on a couple of policy public policy challenges in Malaysia and 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 where uh, behavioural insights um, might be sort of a, of relevance. Um, so, let's start with aging populations. So obviously this is not a, a challenge that's necessarily um, unique to, to Malaysia. Lots of um, countries all over the world are, are facing this. A lot of the way that our public policy is built um, is built uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, is less suitable um, when we have a, a rapidly aging population. Um, and so, you know, we can think about things like retirement, um, you know, and how, how we how we help citizens during retirement. We can think about things like um, sort of service consumption. So, you know, you think about things like hospital waiting lists, um, uh, overcrowding in those kind of services, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so, how can we apply um, behavioral insights to this challenge? Well, there's a couple of insights that are relevant here. So the first is present bias. Um, Professor Nia has mentioned sort of biases. I'm sure many of you have heard of heuristics and biases. It's a sort of a classic uh, sort of set of um, principles, almost a set of mechanisms by which we make decision making uh, uh, that, 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 that steer us towards certain decisions, certain behaviors. Present bias um, refers specifically to our tendency to um, value very highly things in the present over things in the future. We prefer to get our rewards now. Uh, we're less interested in rewards in the future uh, and uh, uh, exaggerated beyond what would be economically rational. Um, so that's one side of it. And you can imagine, I'm sure, already how um, that would have implications for, for policy, particularly around retirement policy, for example. And the other is, is about defaults. Um, so as Professor Niaz mentioned, uh, you know, one of the key things about a behavioral insights approach to policymaking is recognizing that, um, you know, limited attention spans, limited effort, um, this is driving a lot of citizens' decision making in a way that public policy does not always um, manage appropriately or, or realize. And defaults is, is one of those. The, the default the default option is what we mean here. The idea that if I present to you um, uh, a, a default option and some other options, think about it like a pre-ticked checkbox, I'm sure we've all seen these on online forms, um, that can steer and influence behavior. It sends a message that that default option is maybe uh, the right option. It also prevent, presents a uh, an effort barrier. Do I really feel strongly enough to move away from the default option? Knowing these kind of behavioral insights presents us all sorts of interesting solutions when we deal with a policy, a big sort of wicked policy challenge like an aging population. So, so in the UK, for example, um, it there was a policy change that shifted from um, to auto enrollment in company pensions. This is sort of a, a way to deal with with the retirement challenge that I mentioned previously. And we can see just by shifting from 
um, from from opt in to opt out, as in we went from a situation where you could choose to have a company pension if you wanted, but you didn't have to. Uh, if you wanted one, you just need to tell people that you want one to a situation where everyone gets a company pension and you have to tell us if you specifically don't want one. That change led to this 22 percentage point uh, increase uh, in the number of people who were signed up for a company pension. Because there were lots of people who were, um, who, who didn't have a strong feeling one way or the other. You know, there was uncertainty around the decision. They didn't want to expend the effort to figure out if this was a good choice for them. And so simply shifting the default allows us to shift this enormous quantity of human beings um, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, sort of supercharging their their retirement um, adequacy uh, by shifting them to to company pensions um, we've attempted sort of similar things here in Singapore um, we've uh, uh, worked on uh, some projects with the Ministry of National Development Housing Development Board and the wider financial planning program office um, which looked at um, how we can change decisions around housing um, uh, buying a house, buying an apartment, whatever it might be, is often the biggest financial decision that many people make in their entire lives. Vast sums of money are involved. And so it might surprise you to learn that very small tweaks, nudges, as Professor Nia says, um, can influence this decision making. Um, one thing that we found that seemed to be quite effective was uh, rather than saying, you know, what loan size or, well, uh, more so, what repayment period, what loan tenure do you want, presenting different scenarios and then highlighting one in the middle and saying, well, we think this is a good scenario for you, um, led to a significant reduction in the uh, repayment periods that people were choosing, uh, which had a positive um, uh, uh, effect on their um, uh, longer term retirement adequacy. Um, and then uh, another example, this time in Canada, trying to get over this present bias problem, right? I mentioned that we like rewards now um, and uh, uh, we're less interested in rewards in the future. And that specifically makes retirement planning really difficult. Um, but so too does the, uh, you know, the, the effort costs. People find retirement planning a bit um, a bit unexciting, let's say. Um, not very attractive as a prospect to spend your afternoon. And so... You have just yes. a moment. Sure. Um, and so in Canada, um, what we did is um, send a message to Canadian civil servants and we try, we used an experiment to test various different messages to see how to encourage them um, to, uh, to engage in retirement planning. Um, you know, one of the messages, in fact, the best performing was asking them to picture who you'll spend time with in retirement, a way to overcome present bias by sort of using their imagination, basically capturing a specific image that allowed them to engage a bit more with their future. Um, behavioral insights can also help us um, uh, outmaneuver policy pitfalls. So chronic conditions are on the rise in Malaysia and as well as other places. And there are specific insights that are of relevance. Um, so social norms, we've already mentioned, um, but also habits and habit formation. But BI can be um, helpful, not just in designing solutions, but also recognizing what the problem is and avoiding um, pitfalls, as I mentioned. Uh, so one, the social norms issue with stuff like diabetes is um, we need to be careful about signaling to members of the public that everyone has diabetes, because it sends the wrong message about the normality um, of, of, of that condition, which might encourage people to be uh, less attentive to dealing with the problem. Um, equally, um, uh, when we did work in the UK, uh, research supporting the UK sugar tax, uh, the re one of the um, foundations to that work was the recognition that people were eating more and more, but in census data, they were saying they're eating less and less. And actually, there's an extensive behavioral science literature that demonstrates that people tend to underreport their calorie intake and do so more and more um, uh, as they get bigger and they consume more and more. And that led to sort of the, 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 the sugar tax, which again, we tested uh, experimentally in vending machine settings that's now in the UK. And I see that uh, uh, it's something that Malaysia has adopted as well. But uh, when we're looking to adopt policies, so when we're looking to make these big changes, again, it's really important that we understand the behavioral science underpinnings. And behavioral insights can really help us sort of illustrate that to, to draw that out. Um, I just want to finish by sort of saying what behavioral insights are not. Um, so they're not a set of boilerplate solutions. It's not copy paste. Uh, behavioral science is a way to find solution. Behavioral insights are the, are the, are the, are the findings. Um, behavioral science is also not hypnotism. 
um, it, you know, it, it, it's a way of sort of steering people to make better choices for themselves. Um, it's not necessarily going to uh, cause people to have a total personality reset. Um, and finally, it's not instant. Um, uh, you know, it's and it's not instinct. It's not about your gut feelings. It's about methodical scientific rigor, identifying um, insights from the literature, um, and then uh, designing solutions and testing them, uh, ideally with gold um, standard methods like randomized controlled trials. Um, so I think that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Clark, for uh, many deep insights that you have given us in terms of uh, behavioral insights in policy making through your many examples. Uh, what I gather from your exposition is, uh, number one, behavior is not something that you just pick up from a basket. Behavioral insights is based on behavior that is time and tested, and it has been subject to robust scrutiny that can then be used as a basis for better policy making and um, implementation. Uh, you also talked about uh, social norms as being uh, an impediment towards uh, the behavior that you would want uh, the public to exhibit. Sometimes social norms uh, constrain our behavior, and, and that can also lead to deviant behavior, as Mr. Clark points out. And of course, uh, we like your quote on um, Daniel Kahneman that um, environmental effect has an, has an outsized impact on, on human behavior, and so too our biases, where we place more value on what exists today than, than what we can hope for uh, tomorrow. And of course, um, our human behavior is also constrained by how how much effort do we want to put in or do we just fall back on our default option and do what we have been doing all along and you have also highlighted some of the wicked problems like uh, aging and how uh, behavioral insights can help uh, make better policies and better implementation and and of course you have also highlighted that these behavioral insights that have been time tested uh, can bridge the gap between policy expectation and policy itself. And finally, uh, you, you, you did mention that uh, behavioral insights helps you to highlight what the real problem is for which we need a policy intervention and how to avoid policy pitfalls. And your conclusions were equally smart uh, it was BI is not a boilerplate. It is not a template for uh, for, for a ready-made solution for each and every problem. It is not uh, hypnotism. It is not something that you use and mesmerize people, and that's it. And and you get your policy in. And of course, it is uh, it is not uh, in a way that you can say is institutional. It 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 has to be. A uh, modified device, like what Professor Nya said, through regulations, through campaigns, through information, through law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that about rounds up uh, the views of our two speakers. I am so sorry that we are not able to give them uh, much time, uh, and it is too much to expect them to deliver us uh, the whole um, smorgasbord of insights into behavioral insights over these 20 minutes each that we gave our participants uh, uh, sorry our, our panel speakers but i suppose we can uh, take more questions uh, as we go along and and perhaps that will allow our speakers to elaborate further on on the key points that they have highlighted in the course of our conversation so uh, let me uh, pick up one question the latest that came in uh, last in first out this is from mr ibno uh, Kushairi, he say, he asks, uh, what are the examples in UK regarding policies which have resulted from behavioral insights research? So Mr. Clark, if you have some uh, quick answers as to the policies that have been given birth by behavioral insights research. Um, thank you. Um, so I first I would say I mean the, the, the best place to find lots of examples of this um, would be uh, our, our website um, www.bi.team. Uh, we can find lots of lots of examples, um, but I'll, I'll rattle off a couple. Uh, the sugar tax obviously um, is one. Um, 
and and certainly we we, we will also be uh, very supportive of um, work around um, uh, uh, company pension auto enrollment. Uh, the tax example that Professor Niaz gave is um, uh, one example of our work, but we've actually done uh, multiple years of work with the tax revenue um, agency in the UK. Um, of course. I'm sure there are many more. We've worked in education. Um, we are doing a lot of work on financial behaviors um, in the UK. Uh, we have an extensive health practice, everything from uh, you know uh, uh, chronic condition care to getting people to show up to their hospital appointments. Um, um, and with all of these, there have been behavioral science um, research or behavioral insights approaches that have been applied. But of course, um, every policy is, 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 is a team effort, as, as I'm sure all of yourselves are well aware. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, there's, 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 there's probably uh, lots that I'm, I'm missing and, and lots of other agencies that also had uh, their hand in, in, in its creation. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clark. Now this is to Professor Nyes. Uh, the issue of uh, nudging. So we have a question from Mr. P.S. Lee, and he asks, what do you think of the effectiveness of nudging the public to curb the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Uh, as you know, uh, the government has um, more than, uh, has, has increased the fine from 1,000 ringgit to 10,000 for uh, non-compliance with SOP. Do you consider this to be nudging and do you think it will be successful? So uh, the best person for this is uh, Alex because I, I, I know that he has actually implemented uh, some BI project uh, in the context of COVID management. But uh, very briefly, one uh, you know relevant insight that could uh, be useful is to take advantage of uh, social messaging appealing to social norms to uh, align behavior of citizens alongside what is socially desirable. Uh, but uh, you know, I would uh, invite Alex to also sort of chip in uh, in terms of actual uh, example of a behavioral insights project uh, to manage uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, sir. And, and this, you. Question is, this question is for both. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Adriana Abu. Uh, she asked this question, public policy fails, not so much because of uh, we have not used behavioral insights, but the way we have, way politicians have sold uh, their, their policy. And, and, and that, that selling is different from the actual ob objectives that have been devised, uh, which is sometimes muddled because it has to uh, incorporate and dovetail many competing um, interests. So it's, it's basically the public policy failure is because what the politicians uh, have uh, said that they will do is different from the objectives of the policy that has come out uh, subsequently. What do you all think of that? So I'll take this question uh, because this is so much related to the policy cycle. Uh, and as I was pointing out, that policy cycle has multiple stages, design, implementation and evaluation. But I did not mention another stage, which is agenda setting. And uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we are absolutely right to be concerned uh, that sometimes the source of failure is kind of higher up uh, in the policy cycle, and that is where I refer to policy entrepreneurs. These are, you know, uh, higher level officials, sometimes you know, uh, political office political office holders who are continuously looking for innovative. Um, policy ideas to diffuse. And uh, what BI has done is to appeal to these policy entrepreneurs throughout the world, particularly in the UK and in the US, uh, you know, prime minister's office, uh, the president's office has actually championed the cause of BI, both, uh, you know, proactively uh, promoting BI. And so what that does is to sort of provide some kind of a check and balance against this uh, very discretionary or opportunistic, opportunistic uh, intervention at the policy agenda setting stage of policy making. So because you know what BI does uh, is to slow down the thinking about policy agenda setting, right? It is the science of thinking slowly about human behavior. And if we sort of bring in these traditions higher up in the policy cycle, we have greater protection against uh, exploitation 
for purely political or personal cause. Um, and uh, again, you know, because the practice of BI requires bottom-up thinking um, and, and it invites collaboration. All of that uh, democratizes the entire policy of the entire practice of policy making. So I think you know that is where I I, I find BI quite you know uh, promising. But of course, you know I would welcome Alex to also sort of respond to this uh, comment. Yes. I find you know, quite quite interesting. Yeah. Alex, your your take on uh, this gap between uh, uh, what is being sold to the public and the actual objectives and policy that that, that is put in place. Um, I don't know if I can add um, much more um, to Professor Niaz's response um, uh, to, to this. Um, I think that this is this is I mean this is frequently a frequently a challenge um, in the sense that um, in the sense that it's not always incumbent or indeed preferable for us to explain every single step of our policy thinking to the member of the public, partly because there's going to be some stuff that they are just not interested in. I mean, I've seen many um, uh, letters and information provision from government, which spends an awful lot of time talking about the uh, the campaign, the careful work we've done. And, and people just want you to tell, all right, what is it, why, does, why does this matter to me? You know, um, I think the main thing is ensuring that um, I don't think that you're we're, obviously transparency is a good watchword. I think the most important thing is that ensuring that our policies are helping to people to make better choices. Uh, I think if, if, if the objectives are to help citizens, then uh, there shouldn't necessarily need to be this mismatch. Um, and then it just becomes maybe a mismatch in, uh, in, in what information we're providing. Um, and if we can do that in a way which isn't actively concealing, um, which often I think isn't the case. I mean, so if you take the, the mortgage example that I gave, the actual premise of that work was to increase retirement adequacy. Uh, what we were trying to do is get people to um, take out smaller mortgages um, or, or incur less interest so that they were saving more for retirement. We didn't say that in the letter. We, weren't, we didn't send them a letter saying, well, we're going to try and help uh, move your retirement accuracy by doing this. What we said is, um, you know, we think that this would be a good choice for you in terms of, more, uh, in terms of uh, your mortgage tenure. Um, so, it, so I think that um, provided that our objectives are more or less aligned in the sense that we're trying to get, we're trying to help citizens and citizens are trying to help themselves, um, I think that's actually the problem to solve um, often, often in, in these kinds of cases. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Professor Nyash. Uh, so we bridge the gap between uh, policy intention as sold by the politicians and the actual objectives. Uh, Professor Nya says that if we democratize policy making, bring in greater collaboration between the uh, public and the policy makers, then we might have uh, a closure of this gap between what is being sold to the public and what actually comes out of the stable uh, of the politicians in terms of policies. And of course, um, um, Alex talked about if, if if there are no sinister objectives behind a particular policy, if the policy is meant to help citizens so that citizens can help themselves, and I think if we are transparent about that, that our, our desire is to help citizens, then this mismatch should not occur. So thank you, uh, panelists. I have another question from uh, Ms. Uh, Sanisa, PC and Keda. She, and, uh, she says, without accurate and valid data and information gathered from relevant agencies and target groups or the affected groups or even the beneficiaries, the impact of a policy will not be significant and thus will not uh, be seen to be effective. So uh, policies should be evidence-based. Uh, maybe what she's saying is if, if it is evidence-based, if, if uh, is the public servants' decision making is informed by data, uh, then uh, what will be the role of behavioral insights into the efficacy of a particular policy? Um, so, this is a great question um, because yeah. as we speak, Malaysians are continuously demanding about transparency in terms of 
access to information and data for verifying whether policy works or not. And uh, as I was commenting on the policy cycle, um, you know, this becomes a big concern for the evaluation stage of policy planning. When we have a well-designed uh, intervention which has been implemented correctly, it can still fail uh, because we got the underlying theory of change wrong. But sometimes these policies continue because of faulty evaluation, because the evaluator agree, you know, uh, produces um, a report card that shows that the policy works, but then the evaluation outcome is an artifact of what uh, you know, and how uh, has been uh, the policy measured and evaluated. Now, this often comes down to choice of indicators uh, used to uh, evaluate the policy. Alex, for instance, points out the discord between uh, what citizens consume in England and what they say to the government in census report. And this is coming straight from behavioral insights that when we gather data, citizens often produce response that are socially compliant, that do not reveal their true action or choices. Using such data for policy evaluation can be costly. Uh, there are other insights. One I have highlighted that sometimes citizens alter their behavior in the opposite direction in response to the policy. So sometimes the policy fails, but evaluation doesn't pick up this deviant behavior, which are not grounded in irrational choice, but they're rather a strategic and rational response to the policy choice. And, Example of this is uh, school grant schemes in many parts of the world where parents anticipate that government in a local community will give more money to the school. They cut down on private expenditure on children's education. However, at the same time, evidence shows that where parents could not anticipate, this adjustment doesn't happen. Now, an evaluator in charge of evaluating the policy must take on board this range of behavioral uh, challenges that um, undermine not just how we evaluate policy, but what indicator we use to evaluate policy. So these are at the core of evidence-based policy making. And as Alex says, the gold standard is therefore to rely on randomized control trial to make sure that we don't have the wrong report card on whether the program works. At the same time, alongside randomized control trial, we must also open up to experimental or behaviorally resilient indicators that can capture the true performance of the program. So these are certainly new science uh, coming up, which uh, can make uh, the evaluation phase of policy cycle resilient and robust to uh, faulty evaluation. And But of course, this is just one source of policy failure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Clark, you'd like to say something? Or we, uh, we could give you another question. So. Uh, Professor Nia says that uh, database decision making uh, actually relies on evaluation results. And I think if we do the evaluations properly, then we will get the right findings to tweak our policies, to, uh, to either adjust them or to even terminate them. Now we have another uh, controversial question by from Paul Juan Norasma. And she says, what do we think of these frequent changes in the education policy in Malaysia. We, we seem to see policy changes every time a, a new minister comes in, a new politician takes over, and we don't really have a chance to see a, a policy embed itself uh, and to take shape, take root, uh, and then decide whether it is doing, doing, doing well or otherwise. So frequent changes of uh, policy, any policy for that matter, uh, they all become the flavor of the month. And, and this goes on and there's not much real uh, policy making taking place because we are moving from uh, one pillar to another pillar. Uh, what do you think in terms of the efficacy of such policy interventions and policy making? Professor Nias and Mr. Cod. So very quickly, this question is really about policy continuity. And uh, this is a challenge, not just for citizens, but also for street level bureaucrats uh, and, and mid-level officers, uh, you know, because they have to take it as given. 
Uh, when a regime changes uh, and there is this radical shift in policy, it creates all kinds of challenges for everyone. But I, I suppose this is quite outside the scope of this conference. Uh, in this conference, we are really focused on a very specific uh, source of policy failure, which relates to our inability to fully appreciate the range of behavioral constraints for which uptake of government programs are often low, for which you know service providers in public sector don't uh, deliver on time and with full effort. Uh, but we recognize that, of course, these are not the only reason for policy failure, but I, I suppose uh, this requires a different focus and uh, this uh, merits full discussion, but in a different platform. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe add that um, I think that this is also uh, a, an evaluation problem um, in a similar vein to, to that which Professor Niaz um, mentioned previously. Um, where uh, it, 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 it is not easy as a government to shift towards um, a standard of high quality policy evaluation, but it can help um, uh, civil servants specifically um, to, to with, with this with this um, issue around changing strategic priorities, let's say, mm -hmm. or, or changing perspectives on policy issues. Because if we're embedding and saying, well, you know, our, our, our SOP, as it were, is that we evaluate and we do so robustly um, uh, as standard, that can can introduce a sort of uh, the right hurdle. Because you know, we should be changing policy if, if the stuff that we're doing isn't working. But 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 we need to um, really push, and I think it's incumbent on civil servants to do this for their political masters and for the benefit of citizens to say, well, no, you know, we do rigorous policy making in this country. Um, and therefore we do evaluation before we, when we launch stuff during and, and before we, and before we launch, try something new to ensure that we're moving things in, in the right direction. Uh, but that's not, that's not, that's not easy necessarily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Professor Nias. So our panelists are like-minded to say that Evaluation is central in ensuring better policy making and implementation. And policies change because of uh, policy priorities. So that's, that's something that is outside the true scope of uh, behavioral insights. But uh, notwithstanding, uh, for us to undertake a full-fledged evaluation, policies must be given time to mature and to embed so that uh, we are in a better position to assess their efficacy. So if policy priorities change, then uh, evaluation becomes difficult and we are not able to, to grapple with the behavioral insights that such an evaluation will uh, give us. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to our panelists. I say on behalf of the organizers, the Malaysia Productivity Corporation and our audience, we thank you as well for uh, listening in on to us. Uh, we thank you for participating in this session thank you for your questions we are so sorry that we are not take we are not able to take on board all the questions that you have uh, fielded but uh, i'm sure that our, our organizers will be uh, will be delivering your questions to our panel speakers who will then uh, respond uh, beyond the confines of the session today again uh, please uh, thank Mr. Clark and Professor Nias for the time that they have taken to be with us today, sharing their views on behavioral insights. Uh, we hope that this has been a, an informative um, and a very uh, illuminating session for you on the art of policy making, policy design, policy intervention, and of course, policy uh, evaluation. So uh, thank you all, panel members, audience, our organizers for hosting this uh, conference and hosting this session and for giving us all this opportunity uh, to share our piece on what behavioral insights are all about. I wish now to hand over the session to Inche Abbey uh, to close the session subsequently. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. Thank you very much, Professor Nias. Yes.